Hi, I'm Steve Hopkins. My wife Sarah and I began dairy farming here about two years ago. And we're dairying here near Decorah, Iowa, in Winnesheek County, about six miles northeast of town. We're using intensive rotational grazing as the keystone of our dairy operation. We're using this particular method to achieve four goals that we had in mind when we set out farming. First is that we wanted to begin farming with little capital. We wanted to make a living with low cost production uh, in dairying. We wanted to use an ecologically sound farming technique, and we were interested in raising healthy livestock off grass, and intensive rotational grazing helped achieve those goals. Our farm is a rented farm with a 20 tie stall barn for milking the cows, and we have 20 acres of steep permanent pasture and no cropping ground on this, on this farm. We've divided this 20 acres of pasture into 30 to 40 paddocks, and we milk 20 to 25 Jersey cows supported on this pasture. We own very little farming equipment. We have a tractor and a manure spreader and a borrowed four-wheeler, and that's it. We don't raise any crops here, so we do buy hay and we buy grain. And otherwise, our forage needs are provided for six to seven to eight months of the year off this pasture. In addition, we did switch to seasonal milking of our cows this year where our, calves, or our cows are calving from March through June, and then we milk them all the way through Christmas time and dry them up right around Christmas, where we have a dry period in January, February, and March, and then we start into the calving season again. With intensive rotational grazing, we're trying to recreate the herding effect of large grazing animals. What typically happened was that large grazing animals like buffalo would be bunched together in a herd, kept together by predators, and they would move into a grass area, graze it down heavily, trample it, and fertilize it, and then move on to a different spot, allowing that grazed area to recover and regrow. And that's basically how large grazing animals and grasslands evolved, to gra evolved together and created a healthy ecosystem. That's what we're trying to do with intensive rotational grazing here using fences instead of predators to keep the cows, in this case, together. Also, intensive rotational grazing differs from the rotational grazing done in the 40s and 50s in that what we're trying to do is eliminate what we call the second bite. When cows come into a pasture, they will graze off grass plants. They may come back and regraze the same plants, and when that happens, they're damaging the plant and the root system of the plant, and we call that the second bite, the repeated grazing. If left in the pasture too long, it's almost guaranteed that that will happen. With intensive rotational grazing, we're trying to move the animals off the paddocks quickly enough so that the second bite doesn't take place. This is Polywire, a portable electric fence, which we use to set out the size of paddock that the cows will be going into for either a half a day or for a day-long period. The cows are, of course, put in for that period of time, and then after we move them off, that particular paddock gets about three weeks rest, sometimes a little bit less or sometimes longer, depending upon the weather. At this point, I'd like to mention that uh, our extension crop specialist, Brian Lang, has helped us to understand the different stages of grass growth that we can help manage using intensive rotational grazing. We're out in uh, one of uh, Steve's pastures this morning. The animals were just let out and um, sent in this particular paddock to graze. And what I did was I set up just a little bit of a demonstration here to try and explain the uh, forage growth that we look at for the intensive grazing system. Uh, what I have directly in front of me here is a uh, grass-clover mix, roughly around four or five, maybe six inches tall. Um, the important thing here is that we have good coverage of the ground, full, full leaf area coverage of the ground. Um, when you look at the grasses versus the legumes, another facet about this is, is the architecture of that coverage of the ground. The grasses with the more vertical growth, the legumes with the more horizontal growth. That again gives us a much more efficient coverage of the ground. 
But this particular section here, this is actually the time where you would move the animals out of the paddock, not move them in. We want to have this full coverage of the ground to maximize the sunlight so that the grass will grow quicker, uh, what we would call the, this linear growth phase or our fast growth phase, to get the grass back up to this stage. This is the stage that we like to let the animals come in and graze. Uh, we're talking about 8, 10, 12 inch tall height. Again, here's the, you can see the clovers in here and the grass in here. A nice salad mix for these animals to graze on. Compare this with uh, continuous grazing that's pretty commonplace yet, is we look at something like this over here, where we're talking about definitely overgrazing the paddock. Uh, we're down to basically stems, some leaf area, there's gaps to the ground. Um, the sunlight is not being most efficiently utilized. The grass is going to take a lot longer to come back. So again, what we're trying to do is we're trying to maximize that time to get back to that 10, 12 inch height. So if we graze it down this far, the grass is going to take a lot longer to get to that height than if we only graze it down this far, where we maintain the efficient use of the sunlight to get back up to this 8, 10, 12 inch tall height. Another important aspect that uh, people don't often consider when they look at the pastures is what's happening with the roots. We see all of what's happening on the above ground growth, but we need to consider too what's happening with the root development. This is one of the problems that we uh, run into with overgrazed pastures is we end up with our bluegrass pastures with these real shallow root systems. Uh, they don't compete all that well when you start talking about different environments. We get into a drier environment, the bluegrass doesn't do well because of that shallow root system. So we do like to uh, get these pastures into some nice tall grass pastures like brome, reed canary, orchard grass, rye grasses, quack grass, where the roots are going to go down a good two, three feet, two, three feet to where when we do get into the drier environment that these grasses will remain productive. Now the other aspect of this is when we get back to this overgrazing, why overgrazing hurts us so much. I, I talked about the sunlight not being fully utilized because we don't have the photosynthetic area. But also of critical importance here is, is the, oh, I guess you'd want to say it, the roots grow as the tops grow. So in other words, if I come in here and harvest the top, you know, just do a clipping or, or a grazing, the roots will stop growing for a time being and they won't start growing again until the top starts growing again. So as long as we maintain our grasses in this, what well, again we call the rapid growth phase, the roots are also going to remain much more productive. But if we overgraze and we don't leave the photosynthetic area there and we, or we, clip, we overgraze, we clip too often, graze too often, then the roots also are not coming back and growing and being competitive. So it's not just the top growth, it's also the roots that are important when we're talking about competition to keep the other weeds out and also to remain productive through the different environments. When Steve started this grazing system, one of the critical things to look at was the uh, soil types uh, across the pasture land because Steve was going to try and figure out how much animal capacity he had out here, what, what the production potential was off the land. And so it's very important to look at the soil types so we can get a feel for, for a number of things, one being the forage potential, a number being the pasture layout. But uh, in this case, where I'm standing right now, we're, we're on a soil type, for example, as a rather poor soil. It's a Nordness type soil. Uh, it's one of the poorest soils we have in Winnesheek County. It's a very shallow, excessively well-drained soil, very close to bedrock. It's not a deep soil at all. In fact, if we would walk another 50, 60 feet or so, we'd start seeing some rock ledges down the hill there. So it's not real productive. The, the grass that's growing here is mainly bluegrass. We've got some clovers coming in with the, the improvement from the rotational system. But it's still not going to yield as well, so our, our paddock rotation is not going to be real quick on this particular type of soil. Also, the weed pressure is a little higher here, partly again because the grass that we're trying to grow is not quite as aggressive on this shallow soil. So we have a little more of a weed management challenge on a soil like this. 
Now, if I just walk up the hill here a little bit, I'm moving on to a Fayette soil. This is a widespread soil throughout Winnesheek County. It's a good, deep, well-drained, uh, good water holding capacity type soil. Uh, nice, beautiful, lush soil that, that can be very productive. And our rotational grazing system, we're seeing that the, the pasture improvement's coming along a lot better here. We got better capacity to, for, for the animals to, as far as the, the feed that's being produced. In fact, we're probably looking at at least three times the production potential on a piece like this than the piece I just came off of. Um, the other thing is you notice that we don't have quite the weed pressure through here. The grass, again, more aggressive because we're on this more fertile soil. Uh, so it's just all, all around a little easier to manage. So you know, one of the critical factors here then is I think you could see that we wouldn't want to lay out a paddock that maybe covers partly into this Fayette soil and partly into the Nordness soil. We really would like to distinguish our paddocks, uh, having them arranged basically within particular soil types so that we keep the same production potential within a given paddock. Part of knowing when to put the cows into the paddock is knowing when to take an inventory of the farm, knowing how much grass is out there. What a lot of people that are involved in intensive rotational grazing do is take a weekly walk around the pasture, a weekly pasture walk, to help determine which paddocks are ready to graze. And that's usually what I do most commonly, is to, to take the weekly walk and simply take a visual assessment of what's out there. Another way is to use a tool like this this is, a, this is called a rising plate meter developed at Iowa State. And what it does is helps get an actual reading of the amount of the number of pounds of dry matter of forage that's available underneath this rising plastic plate meter. It has a series of, of numbers etched on the side of the, the stick in the middle. And the plate rests on top of the grass so that we can get an idea, a fairly accurate reading of what the pasture density is beneath the glass. And in this case, one centimeter on the right, on the plate, or excuse me, on the stick, correlates to 100 pounds of dry matter per acre. So this is yet a, a tool to help us know how much grass is out here for the cows. And in general, I'd like to see a minimum of about 1,000 pounds of dry matter per acre in the paddock for the cows before they graze it. So quantity of forage is, is an important thing to inventory. On the other hand, another important one for a dairyman like me is to know the quality of the forage that's out here. And one of the things that we're doing for measuring quality is to take weekly forage samples. I will take weekly, weekly cuttings of different types of species, grasses and legumes, and send them to a lab to get results on what exactly are the nutrients in the pasture at that particular point in time. And we're relying on the help of Kent Nelson, a dairy nutrition consultant, to help us balance our dairy rations based on the quality of forage that we have on our pastures. Look at the nutrient requirement of the major nutrients for the modern lactating dairy cow, we see that her crude protein content of the ration should be about 17 percent. This would be for a moderate to high producing dairy cow. Her fiber requirement from acid detergent fiber, which is a, one of the fiber components, would be 19 percent. Her neutral detergent fiber from forage would be 22 percent. Her requirement for non-fiber carbohydrate, this would be the starches and the sugars, is about 37 percent and her energy requirement here listed as net energy for lactation is about 78 percent. Now if we take a look at the pasture composition from intensive grazing management, our 1994 average of uh, samples from this farm shows that the crude protein content to average about 26 percent, which is above the requirement. The fiber component was 27 percent for ADF, 47 percent for neutral detergent fiber, 
the starch component listed here as NFC was only 12%, which is well below the cow's nutrient requirement, and the energy is below the cow's nutrient requirement. Even though we do have excellent quality pasture here, my job as a nutritionist is still to balance this ration. And in the upper Midwest, we, if we're going to balance a ration which needs both starch and energy, the logical thing to look for, of course, is a source of energy from corn. If we look at the nutrient content of corn, we see that from a crude protein, the crude protein level is below that of the requirement. The, both the fiber components, ADF and NDF, are below the minimum requirement. But the non-fiber carbohydrate portion, primarily starch, is very high. It's above the requirement. And so is the energy level. And just looking at this ration requirement and looking at those two components, we can see by blending those two together that we, we should be able to come fairly close to balancing the cow's requirements. If we balance the ration, with corn, it requires about 15 pounds of corn and somewhere between 100 and 115 pounds of pasture per day to meet the nutrient requirements of those cows that are grazing the pasture. If we look at that ration in graphic form, we see that the crude protein content of the blended ration of the blended feeds is 20 percent which is above the 17 percent minimum protein requirement the fiber component ADF is very close 18 versus 19 the NDF from forage is a bit higher in the blended ration 29 versus 22 minimum which would give us adequate fiber for rumen function the non-fiber carbohydrate portion primarily the starch and sugar is 34 percent which is just a little below the minimum of 37 and the NEL is very close to the requirement of 78 76 from the blended ration the ration will in this particular case help to maintain body condition on cows that are fed in under intensive grazing management For our supplemental feeding in the barn, uh, we average feeding the cows about 15 pounds of grain per head per day during the lactating period. That varies somewhat based on the time of the year. When our, in, in the springtime when the, the grass is very high in energy, um, I might dip back to maybe 10 pounds, maybe just a little bit less than 10 pounds of grain per cow per day. whereas Later on in the summer, when the pasture quality, particularly the energy, is dropping, I might go above 15 pounds of grain, maybe up to 18 pounds of grain per day. So grain is our main supplement in the barn. I'm also feeding them some mineral in the barn. And later on in the summer and into the fall, I'll feed them a little bit of hay, just a little bit of hay for, for better quality forage in addition to the pasture. In terms of our, our pasture management during the season, um, we usually put the cows out onto the pasture for the first time around April 20th. Over the last two years, that's what it's been. It's been April 20th. And have them on pasture all the way through October and into November, uh, keeping in mind that I start feeding hay on the pasture in October, gradually increase the amount of hay that they get into November, and then pull the cows off around Thanksgiving and keep them off pasture for the rest of the winter time. So our costs of production vary quite a bit from, depending upon whether it's the beginning of the spring, summer, or end of the pasturing season. And our main costs, of course, are buying feed, grain and hay. And Winnesha County Extension Director Dick Horn is going to be talking about our costs of production. Um, one of the things we want to do with this study is take a look at what the cost of production are and we used a system of cost per hundredweight to look at that because that's how 
we sell our milk, and so we want to be able to compare our costs with the, how we sell our milk to get that, the profit picture. We looked at the cost per hundred weight of milk produced totally. Our feed costs are on, on this line down here. As we see, our feed costs um, followed through. We got into the pasture season. The feed costs were a lot less than they were other times of the year. There were some costs in here because we did have to feed grain in this time because the cows were having some energy problems with the pasture, so we had to put some, some grain in, in, in their ration. As we look at the total cost per hundred weight, we see that that line comes, follows pretty near the feed costs, coming up and then dipping down in our pasture season and moving back up when we start to get into feeding stored forages and putting them in the barn. Uh, we looked at the milk prices per hundred weight. Uh, we, we started out with just a little, about $14, uh, dipped down some and then got up as high as $18. All through this, with the exception of one time, our total costs were still below what the total price we were receiving for our milk. Look over here at the net profit per cow by month. You can see that uh, the same thing kind of happens uh, as we move into the, when we're into the feeding the stored grain, stored forages, and having them in, in, the, how, in the barns. Uh, we have a lower net profit per cow, but when we get into the pasture season, particularly the early pasture season, we saw that to shoot up quite a bit as we were feeding, getting a lot of return off of that grass in that early time of the pasture season. Then we took a look at looking at the net profit per cow per month uh, over the whole system and saw the same kind of thing happening as when we have the cows inside feeding them stored forages our costs uh, uh, are, are different, profit, our costs are higher, so our profit is less. And as we get into the pasture season, the same kind of thing happens. We get a big jump in our net profit uh, during that pasture season. The idea here, of course, is to plan for those. You, you know that during that uh, non-productive time that cow has when she's dry, in the winter months being fed to stored forages, that your costs of production are going to be higher, your profit's going to be lower, and then you work to make that during the pasture season that you make up for that so that at the end of the year, the whole operation comes out with a positive net profit. I'm looking at our most recent milk quality test sheet from our dairy co-op, and I see that for the most recent pickup, September 24, 1994, our butter fat was at 4.68, protein at 3.72, and our somatic cell count is at 72,000. And in terms of our averages on this farm, our cows average about 40 pounds of milk per cow per day, and that's for jerseys. And the, the herd average for a 305-day lactation period is about 11,000, which is just about average for Jersey cows on pasture. Our somatic cell counts average about 150,000 during the year, and they have gone above 200, and they've gone below 200,000 during the year. One of the key components to intensive rotational grazing is paddock layout, or where to build fences. And when we first started farming here, uh, we spent our time, first of all, walking the pasture to get an idea of where the different soil types were on the farm. And we also checked the soil survey to, to check to see where exactly those soil, change, those soil type change lines were. And our intention was to build the fence lines right on the changes in the soil type so we could keep, make sure that soil types were grazed, different soil types were grazed the same. The second thing is that we looked at where to place our lanes. And lanes are very important in dairying because we have cows walking down the lanes at least twice a day to come back for milking. I have a, a map of our pasture right here that gives you an idea of where our paddocks are, which are on, that show the different soil types, as well as where our lanes are. Our barn is located here, and from our barn we have two cow lanes, one going to the east and one going to the west and north that gives us access to our paddocks, our far paddocks in the back. For lane placement, we tried to make sure that we had our lanes either on the ridge top or on the contour. And directly behind me is our most heavily traveled lane, which we placed on a ridge top. And the reason we feel that it's important to put a lane on a ridge top is because with, with all the, the rain that we have, particularly after the summer of 93, we have a lot of runoff on a lane because it gets heavily trampled. Ideally, on a ridge top, that water can go back downhill, back into the paddock, 
where it can be best used. If the water stays in the lane, um, it's going to be eroded very heavily as well as start digging some gullies, which actually we have some example of here. So lane placement on the ridge or contour is important. Farther on down, we have a, an example of a lane that's on the contour. In the background is a lane that's placed on the contour, and where I'm standing is a lane placed on the contour. It's important to put lanes on the contour for a couple of reasons. One, it's much less erosive that way. The second thing is that it's easier for the cows to walk on a lane on the contour than it is for cows to be walking up and down a hill. And on this particular lane, which right here is about 18 feet wide, you can see that it's in good condition. It has a lot of grass growth. It's not eroding. And in fact, it is possible to, in this spot, graze the lane in addition to the paddock that they go into at the same time. Most of the lanes on this farm are about 16 feet wide, uh, which is plenty enough room for a herd of dairy cattle and just enough room for machinery, which is why we built them that size. And at this point, I thought it'd be important to talk about the different types of fencing that we have on this farm. Uh, most of the paddocks are surrounded with a single strand of electric fence wire. However, when we moved here, we did have some barbed wire fence that was existing. So actually, we have a combination of single-strand electric fence, some high tensile wire, and some barbed wire. Right behind me is an example of a single-strand metal fence. This is a 12-gauge wire, excuse me, 14-gauge wire, thinner than that, electrified, that's simply stretched between a couple of fence posts and held up by a combination of metal fence posts, metal T posts, and in between uh, fiberglass fence posts held on with an insulator. And right across the lane over here, we have an existing barbed wire fence, an old fence, that we have added a, a high tensile electric offset wire simply to keep cow pressure off this old fence. In addition, um, the perimeter fences on this farm are very similar to this type of fence, a barbed wire fence with an offset wire on it that's electric to keep the cow pressure off the, the fence. And on some of our cow lane, we have a two-strand high tensile fence that's electric that's very sufficient for keeping dairy cattle in and out of paddocks. Most of the rest of the farm is in the single-strand electric fence. Also, we're working at, at trying to bring water to each of the paddocks on our farm and I thought it'd be important to also talk about how we do that and how we run water lines through our paddocks. One of our goals is to put water in every one of our paddocks for cows to have access to water everywhere. We do that by using a system of um, plastic portable water tanks. In this case this is a 25 gallon water tank that is plenty sufficient for the 25 dairy cows that we have on this farm. The water runs through a one inch black plastic pipe that we have attached to a hydrant near the buildings up the, the top of the farm. We have couplers about every 100 feet and we simply attach a garden hose on here which runs the water through a fairly inexpensive float valve and fills up the tank. It's very low cost, very simple, very easy to do. One advantage we have on this particular farm is that our water hydrant is at the highest point of the farm. So that way we're able to run water downhill all the way to the back paddock of our farm, which is a half mile away. So we're running water through this pipe over a half mile to the back paddock, simply using gravity. There are a number of advantages to having water in the paddock with the cows. Um, just to list a few reasons. With water in the paddock, they can, they're able to quench their thirst right in the paddock without having to walk up and down the lanes to a different spot. You have better distribution of manure within the paddock. You have more uniform grazing within the paddock if they're able to drink right there. And as a result of all those, you'll have better milk production. Stream bank management is a tricky part of any grazing situation because stream banks are vulnerable to erosion when cattle are on them. 
This is a year-round stream that runs through our pasture and empties into Canoe Creek about a mile downstream. Our management of this particular stream has been to fence a stream bank paddock that's about a third of an acre of size. It's a fairly small paddock and manage it separately from the rest of the paddocks. The cows do graze in here. Our grazing management, however, is the, the same as on the rest of the paddocks. We will bring the milking herd on this paddock for a 12-hour period and then move them off and allow this entire paddock to rest for three to four weeks to allow the grasses to recover. We start grazing this particular paddock around May 1st and this year we've grazed at about 10 or 11 different times, allowing for the recovery period each of the times, and we'll probably graze it through October. A sign of a healthy stream is a, a narrow stream bed and vegetation that goes right up to the water's edge. Fortunately, as you can see, um, under this sort of grazing management, we've been able to maintain that type of environment, vegetation that does go up to the water's edge. In contrast with a continuous grazing situation, cattle could be allowed to lounge around in a creek bed uh, indefinitely, and they would spend a lot of time here. And I'm, I'm convinced that under continuous grazing, all the vegetation would be gone here because the cattle would be here all the time lounging in the shade and drinking. With intensive rotational grazing, however, even though the cattle are drinking out of the stream, and grazing right next to it, um, moving them off allows that important recovery period that allows the grasses to come back. And so far, that's how we've maintained this particular stream bank and kept it healthy. Two years ago, when we took over the management of this pasture, um, this particular pasture had been very underutilized and was solid goldenrod and weeds from not having been grazed or, or mode for hay for a number of years. The way we decided to manage it was to first of all come in to this pasture, mow the weeds down, and then set up our fences for intensive rotational grazing. After we had mowed it down, um, we didn't seed or fertilize to begin with, we simply brought in the fence and strip grazed across this particular paddock, moving cows every 12 hours during, during the growing season. Now, two years later, we have a situation where, of course, on, on the ungrazed side of the fence, we still have our goldenrod and weeds, but on the grazed side, we're developing a, a fairly dense stand of grasses and legumes, mostly grasses in this particular area. But what the mowing and grazing um, allowed us to do was to allow sunlight to reach the grass to help thicken up the, the stand of sod and make it more productive in time with a fairly low investment, simply with mowing and grazing. I thought I'd finish up by reading a list of advantages and disadvantages of using intensive rotational grazing that I've found over the last couple of years. First, a list of, of advantages. Cleaner cows, less manure handling, less grain and hay that are fed to the cows high quality forage throughout the summer, manure that's evenly spread, few machinery requirements, a safer environment for children and employees, better nutrient cycling, and less soil erosion on pasture. The disadvantages, you have to build fence, you have to go out and get the cows and move them, and you have to watch grass. Basically, it requires management. From what we've learned over the last two years, we feel that the advantages to using it far outweigh the disadvantages. Well, it looks like it's time for milking. Come on, boss. Boss. Boss.